Well, we've had a fascinating day uh, hearing not only about uh, this radio modulation phenomenon, but ways in which other technologies have succeeded to a greater or lesser extent in uh, uh, clinical paradigms. What I'd like to do now is to try to get put our heads together and think what can we draw from the DBS experience? What can we draw from the TMS experience? What can we draw from the focused ultrasound experience uh, that could guide uh, the experiments that, that need to be done to uh, find out whether radio modulation might be a tool of choice. We have Eduardo Lovo, Dr. Lovo. Uh, Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Eduardo Lobo. I am the director of the International Cancer Group Center. Uh, we have a gamma knife and a cyber knife system. I've been uh, looking for radio neuromodulation in pain for roughly about four to five years. Uh, I'm just going to start out. Radio neuromodulation in pain is an absolute truth, clinical fact. It is consistent. It is consistent in above 70 and 80% of the patients. So the quicker we understand where this evidence comes from, then the quicker we can move on in our field. I truly believe that radio neuromodulation, at least in pain and other disorders in the future, is the future of our field. Now, Radio neuromodulation, or call it radio endocrine neuromodulation, has been proven above 70% in all, all the clinical trials that have been done when you radiate the hypothesis in terminally ill patients. And you see a sustained clinical uh, phenomenon in less than 72 hours in the majority of patients. And this has been around for decades. There's nothing new about this. Now, we learned from that experience. We did our series, and we were successful in 80% of the patients. We've done 14 patients thus far, and success is above 70%. And you get a consistent effect 72 hours after the procedure. Now, what did we learn along all this? We've got trigeminal neuralgia, refractory trigeminal neuralgia patients that were even refractory to radio surgery when you irradiated the nerve. So we started treating the mesial structures of the thalamus. And we saw the radio neuromodulation effect in 60% of the patients. Again, quick pain relief. The only difference was that it was transitory, and we published this. So the patients got better, and then they got worse until they got better three months after when you're expecting to have a lesion. D Dr. But, Lovo, yes. how are you defining uh, radio modulation? Great. So it's now, to current standards, is an alleviation of at least 50% of your visual analog scale in less than 72 hours. So just the temporal course of it makes it modulation in, in your uh, thoughts? In my thought, in pain, yes, because you want a quick, fast relief. That's, that's why you're actually doing this. If not, then you just keep on irradiating the same structures that we've done for over the years. Now, there is a thing about dose, and I think that Professor Regis mentioned the thing about dose. Now, what was different in the recent uh, clinical case series that we just published was that we irradiated not only the nerve, but the mesial structures. So you're doing a peripheral and a central stimuli of the brain. So that's why you're getting a quick pain relief in most of the subjects. Now what happens in oncological pain? And just let me finish with this so we can hopefully start the discussion. So what happens in oncological patients? Well, we learned from the patients that we failed. We learned that it was in a good indication, for example, Pancoa syndrome or plexus. Uh, syndromes, pain. Uh, we learned it wasn't good for abdomen pain 
or pelvic pain, or mixed abdomen, pelvic, bones. We learned that we weren't good and effective in that. But we learned that if you move all beyond treating one target, and you move to treating or irradiating a circuitry, which means more than one target, not just one target, multiple target, you can lesser the dose and be in the ranges that you and I have discussed. Well, this is very interesting because we know that uh, long-term potentiation in the hippocampus, for example, occurs much more strongly when you synchronously stimulate two nodes within the trisynaptic circuit. So uh, it would leave open a question if, and perhaps in Dr. Rezai's paradigm, if one were to radiomodulate uh, not only the accumbens, but the portion of prefrontal cortex uh, to which the uh, uh, accumbens is directly wired, perhaps there'd be that sort of effect. I, I, I wanted to take a segue on the definition of uh, radiomodulation because Professor Regi spoke of uh, a radiomodulation that's destructive and one that's non-destructive and wanted to find out if we're all talking about the same thing. Uh, of course, I think that's extremely important to be sure we are speaking about the same thing. Um, I, I, for me, neuromodulation mean non-lesional. And I was mentioning that when you do something lesional, like a VIM radio surgery, you may have on the top of the lesional effect an additional non-lesional effect, which is around, as mentioned by uh, Kiro Oye. Um, but I agree with you. I don't think we have a demonstration in the phalamotomies for pain that the effect is more than just uh, ablative. Um, and I agree with you, everything functional we do with radio surgery is not neuromodulatory. Uh, so we need to be precise and specific in the words we are using. I'm, I'm following you. Is it the correct answer? <laughs> I, I want to be humble, but I'll, I'll say similar thing to what you said. Uh, uh, your question is important because I think uh, one thing is making a lesion and changing a nodal network. The other point is changing the function of the cells in that same area. And what uh, Dr. Regis showed very clear in his lecture is you make a lesion in the center, but you have a large effect uh, where you have the fall off of the dose. And that's, that's what we showed in that uh, study with the monkeys, where we did make a lesion there, because we were giving 150 gray. But surrounding it, we had increase in neurotransmitters in that region. You had increase in uh, growth factors in that area. So you are really modulating that area around your lesion. Uh, when you do neuromodulation, you sh only, then you should think only in the periphery of the area, right? And that you said lesion, you need to give a dose that is lower dose, which is a dose of the fall off of the lesion you did. I think that's basically what, what you, the point you made, that you, you saw GABA and glutamiergic uh, transmitters there in that, in that, uh, that area that you showed back there in 1990s. That's a true modulation. Lesion is something different. You are just interrupting the circuit that you showed in your lecture. You interrupt it, turn it off. But then uh, lead goes down, right? M much appreciated. Now, when we think about modulation, uh, we're thinking about a circuit, yes? Or are we talking about an isolated region? 
This is where I want to ask uh, uh, Professor Fox, uh, who is uh, an expert at target delineation and such. Do you have thoughts about how to most advantageously target and manipulate a network, Dr. Fox? Yeah, great. <clears throat> yeah, great question. So I, I think independent of whether you're talking about modulation or talking about a lesion, you're still talking about a network. And so even though you, you might put a lesion in, in one spot, that lesion is, is having effects on everything that that spot is connected to. So it doesn't really matter if you're talking about a DBS electrode, a TMS coil, or a lesion, you're inherently um, modulating a circuit, no matter how you go after it. Um, you know, we spent a lot of time thinking about how does that principle inform how we administer a treatment. And I, I heard a couple really important ideas already come out in this discussion. Um, one idea was if the therapeutic target is a circuit, you know, independent of whether you're using your, um, you know, radio surgical technique for modulation or for lesioning, should you go after multiple nodes of the circuit? And maybe you have a technology that's ideally suited to that. Um, and so, for example, if you're trying to treat tremor, uh, do you go after, you know, the traditional tremor target and the VIM nucleus of the thalamus, but, but simultaneously a spot in the cerebellum um, that could be an alternative tremor target? Or, or you mentioned Dr. Rezai's work of going after the medial prefrontal and nucleus accumbens. But I, I do think a, an inherent principle that we're converging on across any neuromodulation or lesion-based technology we've looked at is that in the end you're hitting a circuit and the therapeutic target is a circuit. Well, this is uh, part of what gets me excited about uh, radio surgery, radio modulation, is that there are established modalities for precisely placing multiple isocenters uh, around the head. In the DBS paradigm, which has just been wonderful and miraculous, we're depending on the white matter tracts mostly, the, the conduits through which uh, various separately located uh, cell body uh, clusters uh, feed their, their signal. But uh, would it perhaps be uh, prudent to approach a network from the standpoint of the cell bodies rather than where the tracks happen to be? Yeah, so you can do both. And, and don't forget, DBS has both effects. So, you know, you have, you have Dr. Rezai and, and Dr. Adler are DBS experts as well. But, you know, I, my current understanding is that, yes, DBS does affect the white matter tracks passing, uh, you know, across the electrode tip. And, and a lot of our, our effects, our network effects of DBS probably are mediated via white matter modulation. But you're also having an effect on gray matter. And it's important not to, to forget that you know, most of our clinical DBS effects are pretty similar to lesioning the same spot. Um, and so it's a combination of both white and gray matter. Um, however, I, I think your point is really interesting, which is if the, uh, the radio surgery technique is ideally suited to multifocal stimulation, that could be a, a unique niche or, or a unique entry point that'd be different uh, than, than most of the other technologies that are available. Uh, and, and I think it aligns with where a lot of people are taking DBS, where you know, especially in psychiatric disease, people are putting in more and more electrodes uh, to try and hit more in different nodes of the circuit, thinking that that might be advantageous. Well, the more electrodes you put in, you know, the more the infection risk goes up, the more the risk of the surgery goes up. And um, I, I personally think that, that lesion-based therapies, especially in psychiatric disease, are, are poised to make a comeback, uh, simply because I, I see how challenging it is for, for Parkinson's patients with a lot of psychiatric comorbidities to deal with having electrodes in their head. Um, so I, I think the idea that you could go after, you know, multiple points in a circuit simultaneously, lesion multiple points in a circuit simultaneously with radio surgery, is is very interesting. Or to perhaps not lesion those areas. Yeah, it, it, true. And and you know, again, the, you know, that's the therapeutic model of, of TMS, for example. But but um, I, I think the the real value of a neuromodulatory intervention long term might be piloting, <clears throat> excuse me, piloting the effects of a more permanent intervention. And so, uh, you know, TMS works great, and a lot of our patients get better from TMS, but nobody likes having to come to the hospital, you know, every day uh, for weeks on end. And then, you know, most of them end up coming back in a few years when their depression returns. And so I, I think that um, at least it, it, from my, you know, overview perspective, I, 
I think neuromodulatory treatments, the, the greatest value might actually be piloting uh, the effect of a more permanent implant or more permanent intervention. But I, I defer to Mark on that. He's thought about it for a lot longer than I have, um, is how do you balance out a, a modulatory treatment versus a, a kind of more permanent solution or intervention. Mark, do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's a great idea. And often people won't um, bite the bullet for the invasive um, technique until they're assured that there's a 90% chance it's gonna work for them. So we see that with cervical VNS, you know, it's got great stuff, but nobody wants to implant that when there's a, at least a 30% chance it won't work. Whereas if you can, um, you can do something beforehand uh, with a different technology and then pick your winners, and then say to somebody, yeah, there's a 95% chance this is gonna help you. Um, you enrich your sample and for, for clinical trials, as well as um, helping out people in, in the market. So I agree that using one of our tools to test out and improve proof of principle within that person that this circuit modified this way works, and then going in with more permanent ablation or implant is a great way to do it. Um, I, I look forward to seeing those days, hopefully soon. <laughs> We do too. Yeah, I think uh, people have tried this model with pain um, where they've used TMS to, to primary motor cortex to pilot the effect of, of stimulating M1 for pain. Um, the problem is TMS ends up actually working pretty well and then when you do the cortical implant over M1, it, it doesn't work as well. Um, but, but people have you know, tried to, you know, as, as Mark was articulating, you know, pilot the effects of, of hitting a circuit in preparation for a more permanent implant or predict the success rate of a more permanent implant. Um, I, I guess for, for me, the exciting thing about your technology, if I understood it correctly, is you could administer a very, very similar technology with similar effects and spatial specificity uh, transiently, uh, maybe to multiple nodes, pilot that effect, um, and, and then go back with the same technology and create a lesion. And, and right now, that you know, the closest we have for that is focus ultrasound, um, where you can kind of heat up the tissue but stop just short of the lesioning effect. Um, but it's very, very transient. You couldn't. You couldn't well, there's. Pilot uh, you're, what, what you're saying is close. What we have uh, is is evidence that uh, the radiomodulation can produce uh, upregulation of tightly defined target areas that seem to be durable for at least for a couple years, uh, and there's no histologic, there must be a physical underpinning of it somewhere, but they, the, the tissue has f functionally changed, but shows no evidence of injury and histology. Oh, that's interesting. So you can, you can do it and, and the effects last two years and then they wear off? Uh, this is, yeah, we, it's hard to follow these out. We'd do 20 year studies if we could, but uh, we've got two year studies right now. Oh, I see, so, so it persists at least up to two years, but, but we, we don't know if the effects wear off or not. Yes, animal studies have lasted up to two years. We're obviously more follow-up is needed. Uh, but what about interleaving different, why these modalities work together? Uh, why not a multi-modality approach? Yeah, and I, I think there's, you know, you, you mean combining different neuromodulation techniques where, like Mark was articulating, you, you pilot the circuit intervention with something like TMS, you know, see if intervening on that circuit helps that symptom in that patient, and then go in with a more permanent solution. And, and again, I, I, I think there's a lot of promise to that, and I like that approach. It's just hard because when you switch modalities, for example, when you switch from TMS to an implanted epidural cortical stimulator for pain, you find out that, that oftentimes one works and the other one doesn't because they are, they are modulating the brain in different ways. Um, and so you can combine technologies, but you know, just because you can hit the circuit with one technology, it's not a guarantee that when you switch to a different technology that hits the same circuit, you'll get the same effect. Um, there, there's a little bit that gets lost in translation. Uh, exactly, but the different modalities may tell you different things. And if we're smart enough, maybe we can weave these things together to, for a coherent pr 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 uh, procedure. So, I mean, I think you see in, in medicine today, there's very few magic pills that work for everything, um, where there's increasingly we're combining therapies that, in aggregate, give the best possible outcome. And I could readily envision, for example, HIFU, 
uh, breaking down the blood-brain barriers selectively in certain areas, uh, and combining drugs with radiation. And uh, so I, mean, I think we're just in the early days, but we don't want to be too trapped by, um, by past thinking. I think it's time to be imaginative because we have that kind of future before us. Manesh, you have something to say. You're usually Actually, a man of important words. No, I, I wanted to ask a question, and my question was really, it's a two-part question focused on circuit-based neuromodulation using radiosurgery. So the first question I have is, if you know that the circuit is a circuit in serial as opposed to in parallel, why do you need, why do you need to hit it in multiple places? You just cut the wire in one place, you get the same effect. If it's a circuit in parallel, you probably need to hit it in multiple places. So that's my first question. My second question is specifically in terms of radiosurgery, where we're ex external to the skull in terms of approaching the targeting. How do we know where the circuits actually are precisely in that patient with that diseased pathology, as Dr. opposed Fox to just relying on that Dr. Fox tells us. Isn't that right, Mike? I, I, I'm oh, sorry, I did you, my you best wanted to, to know question, how we know point. where the circuit is in a specific uh, individual. And I said that yeah, you good, knew. Yeah, good, good question. So, so we're doing a lot trying to figure out, you know, once you map a, a symptom onto a circuit, you know, how do you identify exactly where that circuit is in each patient? And there's a lot of fancy imaging modalities to track white matter in individual patients or, or map out these functional circuits in individual patients. I think right now the biggest challenge is we're, we're up against a signal-to-noise barrier where you can map out these circuits in individual patient, but it might take 12 hours of MRI scan. And so there's a lot of effort going into how you improve that so that, you know, during the you know, conventional clinical one-hour scan, you can get good enough information and process it robustly enough that you can say, aha, that's exactly where the circuit is in that individual. Um, but, but I'd say right now we're not quite there yet um, where we can map out the circuit in the individual, but there's so much noise of that individual mapping that it kind of becomes a balance uh, against, um, yes, maybe this is where the circuit is in the individual, but there's also a lot of noise in that map. Or here's where the circuit is in, on average across 1,000 individuals which one do you want to use as your target? And, and I think we're, we're almost at equipoise right now, where you can do it either way, and they're about balanced. So I started my career as an imager, and I love that elegant approach to map group data onto the individual. But I'm a pragmatic clinician now, and I still wouldn't trust that mapping. And if we had a biomarker that we can ping, we can, we can knock out and a behavior that shows us that we're in that spot. I think that, that's a much better way to proceed before we do permanent implants or and I struggle for those. And maybe that's an EEG signal, or maybe that's a TMS in the scanner bowl signal. It's just, just this idea that within an individual, you want something that you can show that that is the target that you want. Then we're golden. And, uh, and we're getting close to that with ultrasound, focused ultrasound. I mean, we're starting to be able to individually perturb and, and look at more complex signals. So I'm, I'm holding out that ultimately we'll have those kinds of tools where we know, just like the thumb movement in TMS, this is the right spot. Yep. Right. No, I, I agree 100%, but I guess the, the ultimate would be a, a clinical metric, right? So yeah. the tremor, you heat up the tissue a little bit, the tremor stops, voila, you're in the right Absolutely. spot. Absolutely, just like that, right. But but how do you do that for addiction and depression? Well, you do it. You put them in and you crave. Yeah, uh, <laughs> was, I just showed us that, right? You show them the stuff. Oh, it doesn't excite me anymore, right, right? Yeah, no, it, it's feasible for lots of behaviors. We just need the tools to be able to do it, yeah. Yeah, agreed. Dr. Rezai, did you have any comments? Uh, no, I, I think it's been an excellent discussion. I think um, exactly, I think looking at multiple nodes, the circuits is really interesting, coming up with uh, biomarkers, imaging or otherwise that we can further fine tune or maybe test people temporarily to see if they have reductions in cravings. I think that's important, but uh, I think uh, it's really great discussion here and uh, appreciate this, this conference, good, good work. Thank you, we appreciate you being here. I wanted to address Dr. Mehta was asking about uh, what's the problem with lesioning a circuit in parallel? Uh, if there's... Specifically what I was getting at, sir, if it's, if it's a serial circuit, yes. why do you need to hit it in more than one place? In parallel, yes, you well, probably need to. And, and I think there's something uh, that per we perhaps haven't defined enough, but. 
there's an assumption among many of us, including me, that lesioning the brain, damaging the brain, uh, while great if necessary, is less than optimal if you could do it uh, without lesioning the brain. Well, I think it's really said, even if it's a non-lesionable approach, I think what Manesh is advocating is you can interrupt this. If it's a series circuit, you interrupt it at any point, you're going to get the same outcome. But I doubt there's going to be circuits necessarily. Some assumption there's going to be a simple series circuit that is probably much more complex than our rudimentary understandings today. But I would prefer the, the smarter minds in this room and not mine to uh, answer that question. Ali. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, I don't know, Dr. Rezai, you want to take that one? <laughs> <laughs> Let's get uh, neurophysiologist Professor Albrecht Stroh uh, to comment. Can Please. I just make a quick comment on, on, that, on those lines? I yes. think uh, if we refer to a paper that was published by Zrinzo uh, in London, and he used two targets for DBS for OCD. Uh, the subthalamic nucleus versus the anterior capsule. And he did see differences in symptoms relief according to the domain. So, uh, and we know that network is very complex, so it, it is not in serious. And uh, even though we are talking and discussing the same network, if you go to, like I always tell my, my patients, subway station here or there, it does connect with the same train line, but the effect is not going to be the same. It's way more complex than that. And just another point of discussion I'd like to bring to the table is that I think we, we don't fully understand the complexity of the pathologies that we are trying to treat. For instance, uh, tremor is, seems to be simpler, but Dr. Reggie showed how complex, and he found a spot in the right occipital lobe. So, and that was relevant. Now, as we go towards psychiatric diseases, and we see, you know, memory, learning, emotional response, depression, I mean, it's a, a, a very mixed uh, symptoms, and we try to use data from uh, sometimes animal research on, or normal brains, and extrapolate the effect of one technique, radiation, or HIFU, or DBS, in a diseased brain. And we don't take into account severity and duration of the disease. So, uh, for instance, when it was mentioned here, oh, maybe you use a modulatory effect, and then you come back and then do a lesion, uh, maybe if you come back five years later in this brain uh -huh. and this patient responded, uh, you can't assume you go there in the same place and now you make an lesion and you got to get an even better result or more definitive. I think it's more complex and we need to understand which kind of networks according to this disease severity. And then we need to add the complexity of any energy that we are applying on that tissue. Thank you, Dr. Gorgolo. I think maybe another example of hitting multiple nodes in a circuit would be tremor, where you know it's it's not that uncommon that we'll end up uh, you know implanting a second electrode um, you know on one side for tremor, where maybe it's a Parkinson's patient they got an STN or GPI electrode, and they'll put a second electrode in the VIM, and I think you know it's they're they're both nodes in the tremor circuit, so you say well why is one not sufficient, and and I think if it's in exactly the right spot, um, it usually is sufficient. But sometimes you increase the electricity to the point that you start having side effects, and you know you're not in exactly the right spot. And every node of the circuit is going to have a different side effect uh, ratio with the other things that that spot is connected to. So now, if you have two electrodes, both in the tremor circuit, uh, you can you know get tremor control with lower amplitude again because both of those electrodes might be slightly off and they might be connected to a, a separate set of side effect regions. But because those two nodes are both part of the tremor circuit. Uh, you get a greater effect on tremor than you would with just one node alone. And they may be independent efforts, too, like having, rather than one dart to throw at the dartboard, uh, the accuracy of the second dart is independent and may hit your target. Yes?
Yeah, I think it's two darts that are both close. <laughs> and so uh, you don't have to be perfect with either of the dart if you got two that are both close. Might be a good way to think about it. I like the analogy. Dr. Stroh. Yeah, I mean, maybe coming back to the question about the serial or the parallel connectivity, maybe we can look at it a, bit, a little bit from a different angle. I and mean, if you look at a cortical excited to a neuron, it, it listens to kind of up to 10,000 other neurons. And if you look at recent imaging study, you also have to re kind of renew our thinking that a specific cortical area is only doing that, only doing visual stimulation. Um, or I mean, there's a lot of interconnectivity. So what I guess what, what can happen is that we take advantage of the intrinsic plasticity of the network. And maybe um, it, it's sufficient if we really push the network at one specific node, and then the entire network is responding and, and moving to the right, um, hopefully, adaptive point. The only thing that we need to figure out is that the new set point is adaptive and not maladaptive. <laughs> and, and, and for that, of course, um, non-lesioning strategies, upon which I would also not count um, radio modulation, might be the help. But I think we, we don't necessarily have to do this kind of broadman area thinking. We have to push there. Um, I think this is something that we can, uh, we can overcome. Other thoughts? Dr. DeSalas. Yeah, I, I have a question about the radio modulation. Uh, and I want to take advantage of Dr. Regi and you. Because first goes to you. You are, a, you are saying that uh, radio modulation at 40 gray or lower uh, keeps it stimulating up to two years. Yes. And uh, uh, Dr. Regi should have the experience of knowing if something like this is true. Because when you, you have done the hamartoma and you, you do a dose that's not necrotic, uh, this patient uh, will be stimulated, radio modulated, when and for how long? Because some of them you have to repeat the treatment. So, so clearly, the, this is a very interesting model because the, these patients, they have at no moment any kind of MRI changes at the opposite of the MTLE where you can discuss about the existence of a lesion. Uh, so it, we are doing every six month MRIs. 99% of these patients, they don't have even an IT2 sign or transiently. Uh, and you see the seizure stopping around one year after. And we have follow-up up to 15 years in these patients. So the recurrences are very rare. So, so if we can speak about neuromodulation, non-lesional neuromodulation, that's not transient. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And this is a very good point. Uh, about the PET and the increase. Uh, uh, what is very interesting is that I think all the patients we are treating at a certain time, they have an increase in, in this local seizure activity, but they have a decrease in the propagation of the seizures, certainly because we have an action on the white matter tracts. And that's the reason why in the MTLE, these patients, they have a peak of auras, because the auras are generated by, by the the seizures locally, and the part of the seizures which was corresponding to a propagation, a spreading of the seizure, is just disappearing. So they have much more seizures, but very short, very transient, and that's exactly what we have in the gelastic seizures or the amatoma too. So they can have a peak of just, just gelastic, they stop to have the comp complex partial seizures. Because we have this transient increase of the seizures, which is not a problem because we are preventing the propagation, but that this is corresponding to the PET study. And this is transient. So, Jean, when I, I hear you, but why does it take nine months to a year for seizures to get better with hypothalamic hematoma if it's not necrotic? What's going on? What's the biology? No clue. Because <laughs> I mean, we because uh, everything else suggests that this 
neuroradiomodulation phenomena tends to occur much quicker, much faster. Certainly, the data we presented today suggested that it's frequently within weeks, if not days. The, again, we go back to the problem of the definition of what is neuromodulation. Yes, yes. If you think this is a pure uh, 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 non lesional, uh, you yeah. can have a non lesional effect several months after. Uh, okay. Okay. If you think this is uh, this is what we have in the, the trigeminal neuralgia when we have the patient right immediately pain-free or like in the hypophysectomy where we have immediate, quite immediately in a few hours patients who are pain-free. Um, these are completely different phenomena and you're right, we use the same term and we are covering two aspects which are cascade of events which are different, sure. We've got a lot of work ahead of us. Alexandra, she'll be, she knows the answer. <laughs> I wish, but uh, plasticity, it's not always that fast. So if we look at the dystonia patients, it does take months. So I think it depends on the pathology, the network, and very likely on the amount of plasticity you need to induce to get your clinical effect. Because everybody here has a patient that ran off generator uh, power for dystonia. You have one case I remember from UCLA that took three months for the dystonia to get it started to come back, and he was off. What's the biology that initiates that plasticity? What, what's, what's the neurochemical change? Probably you activate the receptors that are going to induce different uh, connectivity and neurotransmitters balance, and that will impact in cortical neuroplasticity. So you go all the way throughout the systems. That's the most accepted I mean, theory, I don't at disagree least. disagree with what you're saying. I just kind of want to keep you focused. What I think is some fascinating biology out there. That we, for all, in all eternity, we put out free radicals through a chromosome. And maybe they do, but uh, I think there's a whole new world out there that I'd like to understand better. And that's why we did the work with squid axons. Hoping is such a pure little neurophysiologist, a model where you could try to understand how radiation can change um, uh, uh, channels, ion channels. Well, I, I don't think it's, I'm waiting for you to come up with these words. I just want to make a comment uh, on, on the delayed effect. I think uh, the, the immediate effect that you had in the uh, white matter tracks, uh, that's very interesting. That's as fast as probably. Uh, you are losing the myelin there because this oligodendroglia will give a, a myelin that's very sensitive to radiation uh, immediately. So you make the patient happy because he stopped to having seizures and he's laughing all the time because now he has only the gelastic seizures. The gelastic seizures to go later, I think it's probably a, a, a vascular effect as well because you're giving, you giving 17 gray, 18 gray, this is those for an AVM to go away. So if you do anything in the microvasculature that is very slow, it probably you will not see in the MRI scan because many times you don't see any changes in the MRI scan and the AVM goes away. Well, so vascular, I think it's important that we are not taking into the consideration. After there is, I think in the delay, there is two different phenomena. There is one which is related to the delay of the local effects of, of what you have been doing, um, the mechanism, and there is a delay which is how what you have been doing locally is transforming in the clinical effect you are expecting, which is completely different. And we, we, see, this for, we see this for the DBS. When we are putting the electrode in the VIM in the DBS, we have the effect immediately, and you stop the check, tremor is coming back. And when you put an electrode in the entire capsule for OCD, this is taking months or years to have really the full effect of your stimulation because you are activating certainly a complete circuitry, a, a slow uh, plasticity. And, and, and so, so I think we have to take care uh, not to over interpret uh, 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 the, the, the delay, that can be also plasticity, induced plasticity. Thank, thank you, Dr. Rashid. Could I uh, have Mark George comment on the delay of neuromodulation effects that we see not only in DBS, uh, but that we've seen in TMS 
And uh, why, why the delay, Mark? We hit, we hit the right area with the right amount of energy. How come it takes so long to get the effect we want? Well, sometimes it's disease specific. You know, we go to the right spot with dystonia and we rarely get acute effects. It takes a while for those to, to occur. It seems to be it's the illness. And then when say the DBS device breaks, it's a while for them symptoms to come back. Whereas with Parkinson's tremor, for example, it's almost instantaneous, both on and off. So I think some of this has to do with the plasticity of the circuit and not necessarily our devices. However, we used to think that, and ECT is acute on, acute off, uh, for depression, uh, and I used to think TMS took you know five, four to six weeks, and now we found that we can uh, up tempo it and deliver ten treatments a day and get everybody well in a week. So sometimes we can change the onset or offset of the symptoms as a function of the device, but but I think there's a lot of it that has to do with the underlying pathology, and then our devices are interacting with that in in a way of long-term plasticity. But it's really fascinating, and it's also fascinating whether the the uh, the delay and the amount of time it takes for the device to work is mirrored by how quickly the res the symptoms return if the device starts wearing off or breaks. Uh, it seems to be a nice mirror effect that nature has given us, but I'm, I'm always looking for examples where that's not true. <laughs> anyway, those are my thoughts. It's very interesting. It's not just the brain stimulation, but it's the pathology and the circuit and plasticity. And I, I agree with Mark. I think it's symptom specific. So, you know, post-stroke symptoms, you, you mentioned dystonia. You know, post-stroke dystonia takes a while to develop. Um, and so there's, there's something about certain symptoms and, and the pathophysiology of them that they have a longer time course or a shorter time course versus tremor. You know, we know it's an abnormal oscillation. We know where the circuit is. You can measure the abnormal oscillation. And as soon as you break that oscillation, tremor's done. Um, so... Can I make a quick comment here? Um, because I think that the, one of the basic uh, hurdles that we need to cover uh, this group is to yet define what we're trying to say about radio neuromodulation and its applications to uh, neuro, to the functional areas of neurosurgery. Because it is crucial that we understand if we see a rapid transitory effect did we just witness radio neuromodulation? Or do we see it in a delayed fashion? What are we witnessing then? Are we seeing a therapeutical effect, which is different in concept from radi radio neuromodulation at the basis? Now, the important additional questions, of course, after defining exactly by pathology, what does that mean, is, the, is your strategy. For example, at least this is what I'm str um, stumbling or dealing with. With pain, for example, for trigeminal neuralgia, a refractory, true trigeminal neuralgia, refractory to anything, balloons, whatever you want. What you want to do by radiating dual targets is to stop the crisis by a radio neuromodulatory effect. But by irradiating the nerve, what you want to do in the long run is be effective because you, we already know this therapeutic works. So if you have a crisis here, what we, at least we're, we're intending to do is stopping the crisis to let other modality treatments that we know are effective work. And just a possibility, and just to throw this here. Specifically, but, what uh, disorder are you speaking of? Um, trigeminal neuralgia, I mentioned. Okay. But again, if you've just, wondering because we've talked here about addictions right so you have a crisis of addictions so if in the possibility you radio neuromodulate by irradiating bilaterally a nucleus accumbens do you stop and do you make a patient that was refractory now uh, refractory now treatable to the other treatments that are available so so those are the things that we struggle upon now I had uh, one, one question for the group. This, uh, this radio surgery treatment that you guys are developing, can that be administered safely in someone that already has DBS electrodes implanted? Yes. Yes. Sorry. Sorry. 
So I think that's a unique advantage to, uh, to focus ultrasound, um, where it's not uncommon that we have patients that uh, would love to get focus ultrasound, but already have electrodes in their head, or would love to give uh, uh, you know, RTMS, but already have electrodes in their head. And so you know, the, um, the symptom problems we have in patients with chronic DBS electrodes, there's really not a good neuromodulation intervention that's, that's fully safe for them. And so if this radio surgery is, um, you know, I, I, I'll have to think about, um, you know, applications of this technology in my DBS patient population, because um, I, I think there could be a lot that could be done. Um, Evan Thomas, radiation oncologist at Ohio State. Um, so it's, it's been absolutely fascinating to, to see the wealth of neuromodulatory technologies that have been displayed today. And uh, although I do have a passion for, for uh, neuromodulatory uh, indications for movement disorders and pain and so forth, the oncologist in me can't help but wonder if we're not um, giving appropriate weight to the possible implications of neuromodulatory tech, uh, techniques to tumor microenvironments. We've seen you know, displays of how HIFU and, and low frequency ultrasound, um, and we know uh, focal applications of radiation can disrupt blood brain barrier. So should we not also be thinking about trying to modulate the uh, microenvironment of, of tumors, just like we're talking about modulating the microenvironments of glioneuronal environments and, and functional networks um, with potential applications for increased deliverability of drugs that may not otherwise cross the blood-brain barrier, um, increased uh, deliverability of viral vectors for viral therapy of gliomas and so forth, and um, perhaps increased uh, deliverability of native CD4, CD8 T cell populations that might make otherwise um, immune, uh, immune cold environments more responsive to modern immune therapies. Comments, anyone? Let me actually illustrate the flip side of that. <clears throat> we talked about um, um, in, in patients with seizures, how it takes time for things to change. There is a well-known oncologic trial done by the European ZORTC 22644, which was done in low-grade glioma patients. And this was a trial done at a point in time when uh, the surgical and the oncologic community were split as to whether, that, whether radiation had a role in patients with uh, grade two astrocytomas, low-grade gliomas. So it was called the non-believers trial. Half the patients were randomized to radiation, half were randomized to observation and delayed radiation at the time of tumor progression. There was no difference in overall survival between the two groups, but a dramatic decline in seizure frequency in the early radiated group occurring six to nine months out after completion of fractionated radiotherapy almost analogous in the time course with what you're doing. Completely different radiation paradigm, but a dramatic reduction in seizure frequency. So I think there are cross-fertilization lessons here that we simply don't understand. So, so it, uh, absolutely, um, and that's known for, for years that we can have this effect on epilepsy, although there is also, interestingly, several series of fractionated radiotherapy for MTLE, epilepsy, um, and they, they have a very significant effect on epilepsy, but they have very few seizure cessation. Um, the, the rate of true seizure-free patient is much, much lower. Uh, but, but definitely there is also a, an effect, and there is also an effect of brachytherapy demonstrated. I, I would like just to make a point. Um, uh, uh, we're speaking about pain, and I think w one thing which is extremely important, all, all of us where we are meeting because we are all invested, uh, in interested by, by radio surgery. Um, however, uh, it is clearly very important to, to understand where the radio surgery can modulate and be uh, interesting, favorable for, for the patient. And there is, I think, circumstances where clearly we, we need to, to change weapons. Um, and, and I think this is specifically true in pain. 
I think the result of situation in pain where tr truly uh, uh, neuromodulation, electrical neuromodulation is better. Um, and some other circumstances where, where the radio surgery is great. Um, personally, I would be very uh, 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 refrain to perform a hole in the thalamus just because I want to make faster the effect of the radio surgery of the nerve, if I understood correctly what you said. Uh, but, because making a hole in the thalamus in a patient who, who is likely to be pain-free uh, Ninety-three percent uh, likely to be pain-free in one month, uh, just to make it faster. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit uh, uh, against the principle. I must say. Yeah. Be beyond defending uh, the, the the dose or the technique, um, what we learned there is that we could go at a much lower dose. So. For oncological patients, we're in 90. And, and, and I truly believe that multi-circuitry irradiation, you could be possibly effective at 60. For some reason, the 50, 60 gray dose has come up. But what we learned was that if you irradiate multiple targets, you can much lower the dose and thus, and thus not produce a lesion or a hole in the thalamus. Are these palliative patients? Are these palliative patients, Dr. Lowell? Yeah, the pa palliative patients. So the they have a limited lifespan and they're in a pain crisis. Correct, yes. And in in, in those patients, and, and even I, I am sure in trigeminal patients now, because of what we've seen in the palliative patients, we lower the dose already from 140 in trigeminal to 110, and it's effective the same. And in oncological patients, we lowered it to 90, and it's effective the same. So I am, regardless of, of the reasons we did what we did, because we don't have access to DBS, for example, in my country. Regardless of that, I am sure you can lower the dose, and you you don't need to make a hole in the thalamus, and that is the true beauty about radio neuromodulation. If this is true, you have the most non-invasive and safest alternative compared to everything that has been presented here. If there are no further comments, um, hey, any further comments before we close the round table? Um, I, I have one question. Yes. Um, is, any, is anybody aware of any microdialysis experiments in the brain sampling the area of treatment for, with radio surgery? No, I'm not. What was the question? Is there microdialysis in, in the brain with brain stimulation? No, with after radio surgery to the, to the target because oh, we're all... I don't know about that. I know the group at Yale um, was doing microdialysis with DBS. Yeah. They had some special leads where they were able to sample uh, while they were doing that. But I'm not sure about after radiation surgery. It's an interesting idea. Hmm. Yeah. comment, how, how do we do this, right, the induced plasticity and effect. I think this is something, because, you, you know, the beauty is that it's non-invasive. But I, unless we get invasive, I don't think we are going to fully you know, understand the process. Yeah. Yeah. I think what that shows is that uh, we should not uh, uh, assume that because our imaging does not show anything, that we're not doing anything. You know, I mean, we are just not there yet. You know, maybe we will come a better imaging, a better sequence of MRI scan, or a better molecular imaging that will show truly what we are doing. And that's how Dr. Oye uh, perfected the, the gamma thalamotomy, because he did invasive monitoring and
I'm just going to wrap up here. I'm not going to have much to say. I think everything's been said here today. But mostly, I want to thank everybody for participating in this conference. Uh, those of you who participated by Zoom, we're very grateful. Even more so, those of you who were able to make the trip today. And so uh, I, I learned a lot. I hope you all feel similarly. I can feel you know, a genuine excitement for the area of work we're doing today. And I think collectively, there is a, a great story to be told. And I hope in the coming year or two that uh, we have a chance to meet again. And when we do, there will even be uh, sort of uh, a stronger groundswell for this opportunity to sort of change brain function in some of the most severe diseases of mankind today. So thank you. for um, Casey, you want a, one last word? It's a, a nice opportunity to bring our thoughts together academically to submit, you know, an article. It could be to Curious, it could be to, you know, Brain Stimulation or one of the Radonc journals. But to, if we're going to meet annually to have sort of a proceedings of our meeting, and this would be the inaugural meeting. So it'd be a nice uh, opportunity. I like how you think. <laughs> I happen to know a journal that can help too. So, but, but, uh, but I, I think we don't want to be proprietary here. There's a huge story to be told. And uh, we've even, we had some suggestions that maybe the next place to hold this meeting is the NIH, because we would like some research dollars to you know, expand the work being done in the field today. But ultimately, thank you all. This was a great meeting, and I hope you feel as positive as I do about what just happened. So thanks.